morning. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be back among you, amongst you, um, in terms of talking about fiscal policy. Um, since we last met, um, we've continued to collect responses on our budget choices website. Um, and I think we're up to about 2,150 um, the other day when I checked. So thank you all. And we've shared those with um, legislators and provided district related breakdowns or approximation of districts. So just to bring you up to date on that. Um, if you've spent any time reading the news, you've seen that the legislature is still toiling away uh, in trying to grapple with the choices uh, that they face. And um, we're pleased to have um, Commissioner Lucinda Mahoney with us this morning mm -hmm. to talk about the proposal that the governor has rolled out to the legislature. Um, I realize that in a lot of ways, this is kind of quote old unquote news, um, except that this is an opportunity for us to engage with the commissioner and to ask questions um, about the proposal, which we you don't get to do when you just read about it in the newspaper or listen to a, a hearing down in Juneau. And uh, we're going to also, we've invited um, Senator Von Imhoff to talk about her proposal as well as Representative Adam Wool. And so they're scheduled over the next several weeks. Um, so we'll, we'll have opportunities to discuss with them. And by then, presumably the session, at least the first special session will be concluded. And so we can think about next steps or what role or what um, work we would like to do as it relates to um, the choices and trade-offs the legislature faces. So with that, th welcome everyone. Um, uh, Juanetta, I'll turn it back to you and Luce, uh, Juanetta is going to do her excellent job of moderating our session and uh, appreciate all of you joining us this morning. All right, thanks, Cheryl. Uh, Commissioner, I'll go ahead and bring you in and uh, I'll, uh, you want me to share your deck right away or? Sure, yeah, that sounds good. Well, can we talk about Lucinda for a second? Oh, uh, sure. Commissioner? Yeah, right. just for an introduction. Okay, um, sure. You know, Sure. Um, I had the good fortune of working with um, Lucinda when she was the chief fiscal officer at the municipality of Anchorage. And it's great that she brings her private sector experience as well as her public sector experience to her new role as commissioner of revenue. So we're really pleased that you're, you're taking the time really to join us. And mm. it's great to, great to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cheryl and Juanetta. Uh, well, first of all, good morning, and uh, thanks so much for inviting me to, to present to you um, the governor's plan for uh, fiscal sustainability. Um, this morning, what I'm going to do is I am going to provide you with some information um, about uh, one of the governor's, <clears throat> excuse me, constitutional amendments, which is to protect the permanent fund in the constitution to establish uh, and protect the dividend, as well as the power cost equalization fund in the constitution. And it is the governor's position that by establishing these three key components of our um, fiscal environment into the constitution, that that will provide a framework for a comprehensive uh, fiscal uh, plan. So as I, I know that this group is, is a very knowledgeable group, and so I am um, not going to go into a lot of the, the details in terms of describing you know, our situation. Uh, I'll talk about things more at a higher level with you because I, I know that you're, you're all there. But um, just in summary, um, you know, we have depleted our savings uh, by $16 billion uh, to, down to just $1 billion since 2013. And um, the legislature just continues to keep kicking the can uh, down the road in terms of really trying to establish some structure and a fiscal plan. One of my primary goals as commissioner is, is to really work with the governor and the legislature to, to facilitate and to really get the discussion moving on some fiscal sustainability so that we can change the conversation in our state from budgets and dividends to hopefully 
really important things like economic development, diversifying our economy, and you know, establishing more jobs. So with that, if we go to the next slide, <clears throat> in terms of the agenda, um, I'm going to just provide quickly an overview of these constitu the constitutional amendment, uh, and then uh, just go through um, our current challenges from a fiscal sustainability, and then go provide some details in regard to um, the governor's proposal. So moving on to the next slide, um, the governor really does want to hear um, the people's voice. And so as a result of uh, making, proposing some amendments to the constitution, um, these would require um, a vote of the people. And so his proposal, um, if passed by the legislature would be on the ballot in November of 2022. So, so oh, back up. <laughs> back one slide. So any, it, and anyways, I'll keep going while one that it turns the slide back. Uh, so um, the governor's objective is to, first of all, is everything okay? Uh, sorry. Okay, <laughs> is to, uh, I'll, I'll just keep going and, okay. and hopefully folks can listen while, while Winetta gets the slide up. Currently the PERM fund is set up as a trust. And so it has a two account structure. And um, the constitutional amendment in regard to the permanent fund itself would, would modernize it, modernize it by establishing um, the principal and the earnings reserve into uh, one account uh, being an endowment. And the distribution, which is called the percent of market value draw would be limited to 5%. And actually the way the language in, the con in our amendment reads is it would be up to 5%. So to the extent that folks think that 5% on a real return basis is too high, um, four and a half percent uh, is, is also an option or whatever number under 5% in regard to the draw. Um, the goal would be to identify that 50% of the POMV uh, would be uh, distributed to Alaskans as a permanent fund dividend, and then 50% would be available um, to support government. Uh, the language uh, associated with this um, would, uh, would be enshrined into the constitution. And so the governor's goal then is to just take this conversation off the table um, and establish some structure and sustainability in regard to that. Additionally, another component um, of the plan is to move the power cost equalization fund uh, into the PERM fund. And uh, currently this fund has uh, 1.1 billion in it. And um, it would uh, enable this fund to continuously be protected. It would be invested. Um, it would actually become a part of the PERM fund and invested the same way the PERM fund is currently. And then lastly, the last component of the plan would be to provide a, a one-time bridge funding of $3 billion um, from the PERM fund uh, ERA account to the CBR. And uh, what this would do is it would enable um, management of deficits in the near term that would position us and move us into a surplus environment in about five years. So um, I'll go through the details of that and I will show you the specific numbers um, for those of you who like seeing numbers um, that uh, support the governor's plan. So next slide. So I'm just going to, to start with um, some of just the background in regard to where we've been. Um, this is a, a graphical representation of revenues uh, since statehood. So you can see in the more recent years to the right, uh, the revenue volatility um, that we've experienced. And this is obviously a result of um, the fluctuations in oil price. So for example, in 2005, um, the price of oil was $45 a barrel and it went up to $113 a barrel and then it crashes. So we, 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 do, um, we do experience volatility as everyone in this room knows. 
Uh, next slide. And what we've done here now is, is we've over, I've overlaid the expenses with the revenues. And so you can see historically, we've generally spent um, the same amount or approximately uh, as what our revenues are until um, 2013. And that's where we started to deviate. So, and, and you can click on the next slide too there, Juanetta, because it provides some explanations. So in the area where you see the red line go over the blue line, that represents the gap, that space there, in regard to where we started spending out of savings in order to balance our budget. So what happened was um, we, you know, we increased expenditures um, in the time frame um, beginning in 2007. Well, actually, 2005 as the price of oil went up, we started spending more. We started providing more money uh, to communities. But then when the price of oil fell, um, we we didn't reduce our our uh, spending. So that is what caused us to to enter into these gap periods. Um, in 2019, there was a recognition that the depletion of the CDR was occurring pretty quickly. And so then the legislature voted to begin the POMV uh, draws uh, from the PERM fund uh, to enable us to continue to have a balanced budget. So here we are, we've pretty much depleted our savings and um, there is just a recognition that we really need to solve this problem. So this is just a, this next slide is, is just a, a graphical representation of the issue that is, uh, is, is really the focus of the conversation. And that is uh, of the draw, what percent should really go to fund government services versus what should fund uh, PFDs. So at the top left, you can see, you know, the barrel of oil. We're, uh, back a slide. No, nope. there we are. Yep. You know, the, ro the royalties are deposited, and I'm just going to provide a real high level view of, of how things work. The royalties are deposited into the PERM fund, and, um, and the PERM fund spins off uh, investment earnings. And um, what is really great is that since inception, investment earnings have averaged 8.6 percent, which is which is very, which is phenomenal. However, this year we are in the 25 to to 30 percent return environment, and the perm fund is is at around 81 billion dollars. So we've seen phenomenal growth in the perm fund, um, you know, over the past six to eight months. So assuming that um, we, we continue with the 5% draw, then the question is of that 5%, how much goes to fund government services and how much goes to fund PFDs? And the governor is, is really wants to hear from the legislature. He wants to hear from citizens on what should this amount be? Should, his proposal is that it should be 50-50 and um, the 50 uh, in regard to the 50% in regard to the dividend um, represents his philosophy in regard to what is really a fair share uh, for Alaskans in terms of um, being able to enjoy the benefits of the natural resources, uh, the natural resource wealth. Um, so moving on to the next slide. Uh, this is a, a is a representation of um, the graphic on the right. What the perm fund dividends have been like in 19, 20, and 21. Um, as you probably are aware, for 22, uh, the number that the budget uh, holds is $550, or approximately. So it is uh, significantly lower than the proposal by the governor, which is uh, 2354. And that represents uh, a 50% uh, PFD. So the, the perm fund endowment approach, as I'd mentioned earlier, you know, is an internationally accepted best practice. And um, moving to the endowment 
and limiting it to the the five percent draw and limiting spending at fifty percent of the draw really does stabilize revenues um, and the PFD considering the smooth five-year approach over time. And the PCE also is a component of this, as I mentioned earlier, and that also would be constitutionally protected such that rural Alaskans would be able to continue to receive um, some funding to help uh, equalize some of their costs of energy. So the next slide, um, goes into some detail about um, the bridge funding. And, and this is the $3 billion that the governor is proposing to move um, from the PERM fund out of the ERA uh, to uh, general government. And um, with that move and with an additional $300 million in new revenue measures and or spending reductions, um, we, will, we would experience a balanced budget within about five years. And, you know, normally one would not um, consider moving money from the ERA uh, to general government but it is the governor's position that this would be a one-time situation. And once this, his proposal is in the constitution, then those draws would no longer uh, be allowed. And um, in considering this one-time uh, movement, what we did do was uh, we did some research to see you know, throughout the United States, are there uh, situations where other endowments are taking advantage, for example, of the high market returns, as well as the consideration of the need for potentially higher distributions as a result of the pandemic. And we did note and, and identify um, that Harvard, the Harvard Endowment Fund uh, is increasing their draw, their distribution from 5% to 7.5%. So we provided a link for you there for those of you who, who might be interested in learning more about it. But what was really interesting here is in reading about it, uh, the CFO um, of the organization indicated that this extra draw that they were doing is, is largely to take advantage of um, the high market returns. And so um, I, I think that we are looking at it similarly, um, but also recognizing that we're facing deficits and um, would like to, to do this one time to enable some a balanced budget in the future. Um, the governor's plan does avoid um, the need for a broad-based tax. Um, we believe with just additional 300 million in revenues and or reduction in expenditures that this can be handled via other revenue measures. So moving on to uh, the next slide, um, this is a graphical uh, representation of the deficit um, based on the governor's proposed budget. Uh, for 2022, it uh, represents the, the near-term deficit and then how it would be closed into the future with the additional 300 million in revenues uh, or reductions, as well as the $3 billion bridge. So as you see going into the future, the deficit does close. And um, partial reasons for this is because as the PERM fund grows, and we assumed that it would continue to grow at 6.25%, uh, um, just in the eight years, fiscal year, from fiscal year 22 to fiscal year 30, you know, it would, and it's anticipated that the POMV would increase uh, by a billion dollars. Uh, get, so we get to the point um, in about between 26 and 27 where we are fiscally sustainable and um, we would begin generating surplus. So moving to the next slide, 
Uh, this is a, a, a graphical uh, bar chart representation of our revenues and our expenses. So the expenses, which is depicted in here as the word budget, is the green line, the solid green line that goes across the chart. Uh, the, the blue uh, area represents our traditional UGF revenues. And, and so these, these are the things like, you know, our oil and gas revenues, our corporate income tax and our excise taxes. And as you can see going across the screen, um, that, that is predicted to grow. And um, the, the forecast for oil price going out to 2030 was at $71 a barrel. Um, yesterday, uh, ANS price was $72 a barrel. So we're, and, and granted, you know, we all know that that fluctuates with time, but I know that there were a lot of criticisms earlier um, when we came out with this plan that the, the oil price that was out in future years was um, way too high. Uh, the, if you look, the next uh, area is the orange, and that represents the POMV revenue. And you can see that that grows in time as well. Um, and that's just largely, as I mentioned earlier, due to the six and a quarter percent uh, assumed rate of return um, on, on $77 billion. And that was the starting point that we used for calculating the POMV. But as I mentioned um, a few minutes ago, the fund is at 81 billion. So um, when we rerun our numbers, you know, we would likely be using a higher base, which would represent more upside in these numbers. Uh, the uh, yellow area in the, on the bar graph represents the CBR, uh, the draw from the CBR or the $3 billion. And it shows how that would be used through time to, uh, to manage through the, the deficits, um, which eventually you can see in 2026 becomes a very small sliver and is gone in 2027. And then lastly, the gray area uh, represents the new revenues or reductions. So moving on to the next slide, um, are the numbers uh, that back up um, the chart. Um, so we've provided these here for those of you who um, get into all of the details of the plan or, inter or who are interested in, in seeing the numbers. Um, what you see at the top, uh, towards the top are the revenues. So it's the traditional UGF revenue by year. And then you can see the PERM fund POMV draw uh, by year, and you can see how that grows. Then we've added um, a row for the new revenues. So beginning in 2024, um, we would begin um, the ramp up and the implementation of uh, new revenues such that they would increase to uh, 300 million in 2025. Um, the general fund appropriations, uh, that, uh, that represents uh, the budget. And then um, the line underneath it represents the draw from the CBR bridge fund. So you can see that we would be balanced at the end of 26 going into 27. A really important component um, of the governor's plan is a really strong reserve. And we did some modeling and we, had, we believe that we need at least $1 billion um, in our reserve. And that would be to uh, manage for oil price volatility, you know, market volatility that could impact um, the POMV. And so with the governor's plan, you can see that um, <clears throat> The reserves uh, stay well above um, the billion dollars that we have established, and they should be able to. It should be able to provide a very strong cushion uh, regarding any revenue volatility. Um, then down towards the bottom, it we've identified the fifty percent of the POMV 
that would be dedicated to dividends and then documented the amount by dividend. Then lastly, towards the bottom, we've identified what um, the PERM fund ending balance is forecasted to be. So you can see between um, fiscal year 21 and 22, uh, there is um, a reduction, but the reduction would be uh, in the neighborhood, it would be in the neighborhood of 2 billion, because if you recall, we would be drawing 3 billion um, for fiscal year 22, but we would also be depositing 1 billion of the PCE. So it would be a net reduction of around 2 billion. But then you can see that um, the PERM fund does continue to grow such that by the year uh, 2030, it would be at $90 billion. So the next slide. Um, is is just a uh, just a discussion about um, the special session. As you know, uh, the the legislature is currently in the first special session that was called by the governor. Um, his objective was that uh, the constitutional amendments, which is HJR seven um, in the House and SJR six in the Senate, um, were to be discussed. So, that, uh, so we did have um, some hearings in both the House and the Senate uh, in regard to these constitutional amendments, but it, the majority of the special session, as most of you know, has really been focused on um, getting on the budget and um, the dividend. And so there's a lot of uh, consternation going on in the legislature. I'm sure all of you are reading about it and very much of that is just focused again around the dividend. And as I mentioned before, the governor's plan is to establish and finalize the dividend discussion so that we can move on and start talking about other things in our state. So with that, I think that's the last slide. Um, I'm available to answer questions or, or just really have a discussion with you about it. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Commissioner. Um, so we do have um, an opportunity for uh, questions. You can submit uh, in the chat window at any time. Um, Cheryl, I wanted to uh, go to you first to see if you had any specific questions for the commissioner to start off with. Well, sure. Can we go back to the, the page that had the numbers that support the plan? It was like sure. about two slides back. Sure. That one. Okay. So if I go down to, um, in a macro sense, let's go to fiscal year 2024, for example. So total spending is almost $6.2 billion, of which... The amount spent for PFDs is 1.7 billion. And so that's part of that. But it just seems like it's an inordinate amount of money that is being spent out of the operating budget to pay for dividends. I mean, that's got to be more than paid for K through 12. Um, it's probably, it's going to be more than what's paid for Medicaid. Um, how many feel good that that's an appropriate use? Oh, excuse me, 2.7 billion is for P, P 2.6 billion is for the PFDs. So how many feel good that that's the highest and best use of public funds? So are you asking me the question? Yeah. Okay. Just, so just so thinking out all, loud. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that, that's, that's very good. So first of all, the, when you look at that slide, the 50% per POMV number, like fiscal year 24, that represents the dollar amount. So that's the, the total amount um, allocated. So that's 1.7 and the number underneath it represents, it would be a $2,600 dividend to Alaskans. So, oh, okay, all right. So, yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, so I just helps. wanted to clarify that first. However, to, to answer your question, I mean, that, that is the crux of the discussion. I mean, you, you, you have gone right directly to the point. 
And this is, it, it's really a philosophical discussion and uh, everybody, you know, has different opinions about the dividend and how much should the dividend be? How much of the natural resource wealth um, should be shared with Alaskans? And so the governor's position is that 50% of the POMB is a fair share for Alaskans in regard to sharing the natural wealth. Others believe it should be zero. Others believe, obviously, this legislature right now, they have concluded it should be $550. There are others that believe it should be the statutory amount. And the statutory amount is, I think, above $3,000. So that's, it's a very difficult discussion, uh, but it's a discussion that the governor wants to have and he really wants to resolve it uh, so that we can move forward. Because until we resolve this amount of what should the permanent fund dividend be, we really, we, we can't have a, a fiscal sustainable plan. And the reason is because, and Cheryl, you know this better than anyone, if you can't identify your expenses, um, it's really pretty difficult to target what your new revenue measures should be or what your, what your spending reduction should be. Because if, if the conclusion is that we, um, let's say establish the governor's plan of 50-50, that is very different than 500. So at $500, the amount, if, if those, there are those who are interested in establishing you know, taxes, but when you set up your tax structure, what is your target? Is it targeting a $500 dividend or are you targeting a $2,300 dividend? You can't really determine that until one of the high spending amounts is known. Right. And so it's hard. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's so much just philosophical differences in regard to what is a fair share of the natural resource wealth. Yeah. So listen, uh, uh, Juanetta, do you have other questions or yeah, just yeah, let me let me okay. uh, try, let me try and uh, encapsulate okay. a few here. Um, so, I I think there's great appreciation for finding a durable fiscal policy where we're not having the, this philosophical discussion uh, every single budget cycle. And I, I want to try and capture two points here. One is that, um, as you've acknowledged, that there's been some um, criticism that some of the forecasting doesn't capture the volatility of uh, uh, resource revenues. Uh, but there's also market volatility. Of course, the POMV is supposed to smooth that out. But the using the tool of an amendment which uh, would, would enshrine the amount of the dividend uh, seems to take away from the legislature uh, the capacity to respond to, um, and I'll use the, 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 the Reagan, the Donald Reagan, uh, you know, we've got uh, known unknowns and unknown unknowns and with, having it in the uh, constitution, it really uh, takes away a considerable amount of flexibility from the legislature in the future. One can argue that that's a good thing or, or a bad thing, but uh, it does mean that there'll be fewer tools in the toolbox in some respects for the legislature to respond to future uh, fiscal issues. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, again, that is uh, that comes down to another philosophical uh, discussion and policy discussion. Um, you know, Governor Dunleavy is uh, supports small government, and the POMV uh, limiting distributions at five percent essentially becomes like a spending cap, and so it, it does uh, reduce. Um, the legislature's ability to spend. Uh, there, there is, there's no doubt about that. 
uh, in regard to managing to the volatility. Uh, we, we've done a lot of stress testing um, on our models. Um, we've stress tested uh, different return environments in regard to uh, the POMV. Um, we, we stress tested, for example, the 10 years 2008 to 2018 when we went through the Great Recession. And um, you know, we did nine different scenarios in terms of evaluating that. And um, most of the scenarios came out uh, fine with uh, the 300 million in additional revenues. There were a few where we would need potentially, you know, 100 to 150 million more. And so in those scenarios, considering the, the, the strong reserve situation that we have, when you look at those numbers, um, and considering the five-year smoothing, it gives the legislature time to act. So if they, and, and the governor, they, if they decide that they, they need additional revenue measures, it gives them time to, to get that in place because they would have adequate reserves. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question about uh, rolling the PCE uh, into the permanent fund. And I, I guess a couple of questions uh, along those uh, lines is, uh, you know, uh, first of all, uh, so is it, will it be bifurcated in some way or how, what is the, describe that process a little bit more and how, how uh, P, the PCE piece of the, of, um, you know, continuing to subsidize rural electric uh, funds with uh, revenues from PCE will, will work. Sure. So the 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 billion, the 1.1 billion, would be deposited into the perm fund, and then um, currently about 30 million a year is distributed from the PCE to essentially subsidize energy in rural Alaska, and so that 30 million would become a component of the 50% that supports government services. And it would be the first call on that 50% such that rural Alaska, a rural Alaska is assured that um, that funding would be available for them. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, just again, a reminder to the audience that you can uh, submit your questions uh, uh, in the chat window at any time. Um, you know, there, I guess one of the other Phyllis, I, I mean, I, I got the first permanent fund check and I uh, received all of them, uh, except for maybe about four or five when I was living outside for a while. And <clears throat> again, the philosophical question, uh, I suppose if you lived in New Jersey right now, you'd be ecstatic to get a $525 um, check from the state of New Jersey. And uh, you know, the question about uh, the 50-50 the split, I, is, is there, um, I mean, I, I, know, I know that, you know, your role here is to explain and, de and defend the governor's proposal about the 50-50 split, uh, but it, it, it is certainly a unique circumstance for uh, citizens to participate at that level in terms of government revenues. And it, um, it you know, even within my own family, we have this uh, <laughs> dinner table discussion about the philosophy of it. Uh, mostly that, uh, you know, we have really three generations of, of our family now that have received these checks. And uh, generationally, there are differences about what our level of expectation is about receiving a check from the government. So um, I guess that the question a little bit is um, leading to, if the governor wants to engage in a conversation about this, um, how, how does, what is the information source that validates that most, I mean, I, I, I feel like uh, it depends on how many checks you get in your household as to how firmly you believe <laughs> in this particular policy. Um, but it, if there, 
what's the information source or validation for most Alaskans support the 50-50 split or how how does how how does he assure himself i guess that the 50-50 split is is really the right thing to do well that, that's exactly what these constitutional amendments are intended to do and, and that is to be on the ballot in uh, November of 2022, and let the let the people vote. Mm -hmm. And um, he wants to hear from the people. Maybe maybe they they don't want it to be 50 50. And and whatever the results of the the ballot are will will be the message uh, to the governor. Mm -hmm. I mean. You know, you, you were talking earlier about how fortunate we are um, as citizens to be receiving a check uh, from government. And, and it is pretty phenomenal. You know, um, the team here at DOR, we, we talk to the credit rating agencies and, you know, we are really an anomaly state where you know, 67% of our revenue comes from investment income and we're, we're an endowment state. And it, uh, it's a very interesting conversation because there's no other states that are like this. And so we, uh, we don't really fit in their, their model, if you will. And um, we're, we're actually really fortunate because we have this fund that can can help us uh, manage through. I, I think I think I view this as a time of transition, in terms of um, hopefully positioning us for better diversification against that component of our budget that is fluctuates a lot. You know the oil component, um, but we are fortunate. Yeah, but it is yeah. very philosophical, and in, like I said, there are opinions in all directions on it. Sure. Yeah, th yeah. Thank you, uh, Juanita. And I, I just looked at the responses that we did receive on our budget choices website, um, and we have had two thousand one hundred forty-seven responses. Um, of those amount, fifty-seven percent supports the percent of market value structure, and we gave options about exceeding it, and people overwhelmingly supported um, the current payout mechanism. Um, and so in terms of spending um, and the dividend, 42% said to pay the same amount as last year. They were fine with that. 33% said to suspend the dividend until the state can afford it. 12% um, said to pay a statutory dividend and 12% said pay the three years of the dividend. So it's kind of interesting that yeah. those that work through the choices and trade-offs involved um, and not, and that are not just asked, do you want a dividend that's higher or lower? You know, they, I, I believe it shows that they are thoughtful in balancing, you know, the, the choices. So in following up on Juanetta's question about, um, and your response about, it's important to engage Alaskans in talking about, um, um, about the choice that's gonna dictate future, dis, future actions by the legislature. Part of the challenge is getting the legislature to pass the amendment without the benefit of having good, thoughtful discussion with Alaskans. Because once it's on, you know, passes the legislature, it's up or down, yeah. as opposed to having Alaskans engaged in thinking about what they want the choice to be. And then after you get that input, that be the, the consensus, if you will, or that the perceived consensus of what then goes on the ballot. So it seems we've got the, the cart before the horse, as they say, um, in terms of what eventually we'll get before the voters. So kind of we've fiscal policy wise have always supported and you were involved in our community engagement yeah. kinds of conversations at the municipality in terms of engaging the public um, before the final decisions are made. So if, if he's not able to get um, the legislature to approve the amendment this month, August, um, it could be an opportunity for that time frame. then before next session to engage Alaskans in thoughtful discussion um, about that. And um, Commonwealth North would welcome the opportunity to help advance those kinds of uh, discussions among Alaskans. So 
Oh, that's that's really great. That's really great to hear. And, and you are absolutely right. You know, we need to engage uh, Alaskans. We get them, we need to get them to understand the problem. Um, you know, we've started uh, a road show is what we're calling it. So a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, I was in Sitka, then in Fairbanks, Juneau, and I'll be going to, you know, more communities this summer, trying to, to get folks to have a conversation. And, um, you know, I do a presentation that's a little bit different depending on the community that we're in. But the goal is, is exactly as you said, to try to educate. I, 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 my, I want people to understand that, you know, we are really at a point where our savings are depleted. We need to do something. The time is now. Uh, we, we are fortunate in that we do have a large savings account, um, the firm fund that can help us on a one-time basis uh, to get through this. Uh, the special session in August is intended to, to talk about this, to continue the conversation with the legislature. And then we have the whole next year, assuming the legislature can, can pass something that can get on the ballot where we can really engage in those community conversations and, um, and really get the public to understand the situation and to hear what they have to say about it. Yeah, but my point is to have those community discussions before the legislature takes action. Otherwise yeah. then the public is reacting to what they've done. So yeah. it's input into as opposed to um, comments on. So, but yeah, anyway, point well taken sure. We've had these chats before. <laughs> I know it. And you are very good at this. So I, I know that. I'm, I'm, I'm learning from the best. So <laughs> noted, right? <laughs> uh, um, Commissioner, you know, uh, I'm reminded in, in uh, some of the comments here in chat that, um, you know, Governor Hammond said that, that the biggest uh, regret that he had was that the income tax was uh, eliminated. And um, I can certainly validate that even people uh, in the legislature who voted for it. Um, I worked for a very conservative Republican from Fairbanks at the time. He walked off the House floor session, walked into the office, closed the door, looked at the three staff, uh, us three staff members and said, I think we just made a big mistake. Um, so your plan uh, calls for uh, new revenue and uh, or reductions. And so what, what's the anticipation there? Are, are, uh, I, I think I heard you reference uh, perhaps some new revenue tools in the future. Is, is there anything you want to elaborate on there? Um, those will, that will be a part of the discussion in August. And um, the governor has, has continually indicated that um, he wants to hear from the legislature in regard to their ideas. He really wants for it to be a collaborative discussion. And, and it's not just new revenues. Um, you know, even though we've been cutting budgets pretty, pretty regularly, there's always, um, op there's always opportunities to, to continue to reduce the budget and um, those will be discussed as well. All right, well, I'm not seeing any other questions coming up in, in chat. So I'm gonna just make one last call uh, for brave souls to submit their questions. And uh, Cheryl, do you, do you have anything else you wanted to discuss with the commissioner? Um, thank you um, very much for taking your time this morning um, and talking with us. And, and for those that are participating um, in our Zoom call, I hope um, the information helps you uh, have some good discussions if you haven't already with your legislators, uh, because in theory, they will be back in their districts um, soon um, for at least a month. And um, it would be good to have an opportunity with, to discuss with them um, about what, how they view the choices. And if they don't like what the governor has proposed, what are they willing to support themselves? So this isn't just gonna be a just say no um, opportunity. We do, the state does need to have, as, as the commissioner has explained, uh, a plan to move us forward so we can get off this, this dime or, or more than a dime, but yeah. to get off this, this 
point where we can move on to other substantive issues as opposed to how much is my dividend going to be. So, um, so we welcome uh, um, Commissioner for you to come back and join us anytime um, to um, run ideas by us. Um, as you and I've discussed, we do have a, a pretty well-informed group, which I think is part of the reason we don't have a lot of questions because they, they understand um, the choices and trade-offs. So, but um, um, we do welcome your participation going forward too. So uh, anytime, let us know if we can be a sounding board, if you will. Oh, super. Thank you so much. I really oh, appreciate welcome. it. You're yeah, welcome. And, and thanks for the opportunity uh, to speak to everyone today. I uh, really appreciate it. And uh, like Cheryl said, talk to your legislator. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay, Juanetta, do you have any closing commercials? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, just a, a quick reminder to everybody that um, that uh, we will have a session on July 9th with Representative Adam Wool uh, to discuss the proposal that he um, has put forward in uh, HB 37, and then also with Senator Natasha von Imhoff on uh, July 16th. And um, we just uh, uh, confirmed last night that we will have an in-person event with Congressman Young on July 7th. And uh, so watch your email and the uh, commonwealthnorth.org uh, event calendar for more information about that event. So with that, I think uh, we- Okay, can I do one last, last oh, pitch? Sure, sure. Okay, yeah, because also to our, to our participants, um, we have been talking about doing a program um, about um, the fiscal issues, the challenges, the choices, um, towards the end of July. So if you have any thoughts about what you would like to see in terms of topics or speakers or approach, um, you know, share them with Juanetta or myself or both of us. And uh, so we're in the process of, of sifting through how to make it an, uh, a, 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 a worth, worth your time um, to participate. So let us know your thoughts. So thanks. Thanks again. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks uh, commissioner and your staff for helping get you here. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.